Hello. There we are. Good morning, James North. Welcome. Good to see everybody gathering in here this morning. We are going to start our service in just a few more moments. So if you would uh, make your way in from the foyer now, come in, gather seats, gather your heart and your mind before the Lord so that we can enter into worship together. So we will take just another moment. We're having a few technical glitches at the back there this morning, so you might not see the uh, see PowerPoint for a little while. It'll be interesting to see what happens here. Good morning again. I believe we are ready to get started here this morning. And let me give a warm welcome to all of you that have gathered to worship together. For those that are watching online, we welcome you as well into our service this morning. You've arrived at James Street North Baptist Church. Hopefully you all know that. If you're expecting to be somewhere else, you should go find that place now. Otherwise, stay in here with us, and we are ready to worship together and come into God's presence. If this is your first time visiting us as a, uh, as a church, and uh, you'd like to get to know us a little better, there's a thing called a kit card. Kit cards just stand for keeping in touch, and it's a way for you to give us information so that we can get hold of you. It's a way for you to ask us questions. And uh, if you are a regular attender and have an updated information, it's amazing the other day I was going through our church directory and trying to phone a few people and none of your phones work for the numbers we have on file. So if you've changed your phone number lately, let us know because that's the whole point of that thing. And you could do that on the kit card. You could do that just by writing the office as well and saying, hey, my phone number's changed or I've moved or something like that. It's just a way to help uh, keep us all informed together. A few things happening in the life of the church I want to tell you about. First, starting next sat not starting. Next Saturday, it will start at 8 a.m. It's the men's breakfast. And uh, men, if you haven't registered for that yet, you can do that today. Uh, I'm not sure what the cutoff is, but it's probably before next Saturday. Wednesday, I just heard the call. You need to sign up by Wednesday so that we know how many eggs and stuff to get for you. So men, uh, men's breakfast. And kind of in a passing note, women, you aren't being left out. You have a breakfast coming up on February the 11th. We didn't get on a slide, but set, your, uh, set the date in your calendars. Fre uh, Saturday, February 11th is going to be a women's breakfast. And then we've been announcing a thing called Freedom Session. This is a course that's being offered by West Highland Baptist Church. Where we first started to hear about it was during our sessions on spiritual warfare last fall. Uh, the group from West Highland was here. And if you find yourself just with some unresolved emotions or what you might think are spiritual bondages or things like that, this is a 20-week course they're offering. But I'd encourage you, if, if you don't think you're up to 20 weeks yet, go on this Monday night. On the Monday night is the introductory kind of course or introductory class. It will explain what the sessions are all about. It's a great looking course and if you'd like to go, at least go on the Monday night and just find out about it. And maybe it's not for you this time, might be for next time. You're not committing to be there for the whole thing yet. Uh, but it would be good to go and get the information. You need to go to West Highland's website to do that. You can do that through our website. You can go directly to their website and encourage you to find out more about that. So that starts, or it takes place on Monday, January 30th. And then over the uh, come next couple of months, we have some parent and child dedications coming up. There's one in February, one in March. We've had some new babies arrive in the last little while that we haven't had a chance to allow parents to stand before you and dedicate themselves and how they're raising their kids, but also so we can bless their kids. If you'd like to be involved in those, let us know in the office. If the February, March dates aren't good for us, give us a heads up that you're thinking this way as well, because we choose some dates, we kind of spread these out, so we don't have uh, you know, too many at once in a service, so let us know you're thinking that way. 
Discover James North is a course for new people around our church. It's a time for new folks to hear our vision, our mission, our statement of values, and ask us questions. It's a time to meet our leadership. And we're going to be having a next set of classes for that in February. There's three classes after the services, and uh, we'd like you to let us know that you're interested in doing that so we can properly prepare for it. Check our website. It's always good to go to our website, find out what's going on. It's where you sign up. It's where you connect with the church office to let us know you're interested in all these things. So help us out that way. Next, Pregnancy to Preschool group meets on Wednesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. This is designed for primarily moms or the folks who tend to end up being here. But if you've got kids and uh, you're in that category, it's a great time to come meet with some other moms meet together, have Bible study, prayer, and fellowship, uh, bring your kids, and they have some time together as well. And so I encourage you to be here on Wednesday mornings. We also need some extra help for that. We're looking for two more people to help us with child care. So if you have Wednesday mornings open from about 9.30 to 11 or so, and would like to come and help this group of uh, moms take care of some kids for a little while so they can focus more on their prayer and Bible study time, Get in touch with the office and let us know that you're interested in that. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks for a number of volunteer activities, and I want to thank you for how you've kind of risen up and you volunteered. You're helping us out on Sundays with Kids Ministry. Our tech team has now got some a good group of volunteers that are helping out that way. One more set of volunteers, not on the slides this morning, is the chairs that you're sitting in. Aren't they lovely and comfortable? Aren't you glad we have them set up on Sunday mornings? We need help doing this now. We had a gentleman from the neighborhood that we brought in every week to set up chairs, and due to an injury, he's not able to do that anymore for us. And so rather than sort of looking for somebody else like that, we thought, let's try to do it with just internal volunteers. Uh, the Karen Church, they're volunteering great. They've done it the last three weeks for us. And we're just starting to put together a new team to do that. Joy Church, the Brazilian church, they're going to do it one Sunday or one Saturday to get ready for this. We need two groups to do it. So once a month, if we had eight people that would sign up, groups of four, to come on a Saturday morning, ideally, probably we could set whatever time, I think probably about 9 o'clock, probably take 60 to 90 minutes to set up all these chairs. If you'd be willing to be a part of a team once a month to do that, let the church office know. We'll send out a reminder about that, but while you're sitting in these chairs, I thought, good time to remind you how comfortable you are, and somebody has to do this every week. It could be you. It could, you could have that special opportunity to be part of that group, all right? So let us know. You could talk to me after the service. That'd be fine. Last announcement today. In the Karen Church this afternoon, they are having four baptisms. There's four uh, young men, young adults are getting baptized. Uh, Tune, Wilson Mu, Daniel Hay, and July Paul. Some of you know these folks. And if you would like to come this afternoon at 2 o'clock and be part of that service, uh, Pastor Duane's going to be preaching for them this afternoon. So if you'd like to come and see what happens to the Karen service, be witness to these baptisms to encourage these guys, that would be a great time for you to take part. It happens at 2 o'clock right back here, and uh, you can be a part of all those things. All right, that was a bunch of announcements, but that's it for me. I'm going to invite you to stand now. And Jesse's going to lead you in a call to worship and then lead us into song. Good morning, James North. It's good to be together again. Uh, I want to read this passage of scripture. Um, this is right after David finds out he's not going to be able to build the temple. Um, but he prepares a bunch of the materials and he gathers all of the people together. Uh, and this is what he prays. And um, if it's more helpful, I don't know if we... Uh, okay. If it's more helpful to um, close your eyes and to follow along that way, this is actually a prayer. David prays this in front of the assembly. He prays this with the assembly. The assembly joins him with this. So I just want to invite us to align our hearts with what David says. Um, yeah, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and that we would, uh, that we would pray this together. Praise be to you, Lord. 
the God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. And would this be our response this morning? Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. So let's, let's sing together. your phones. This is the one time I'm going to encourage you guys to pull out your phones in church. Uh, so this song is called uh, Holy Jesus You Are. Oh, it's thank you Lord. And thank you Stacy. Come on y'all. It's actually been like a hectic morning on, on tech back there and, and people on tech don't get enough credit. So thank you all. that again. <laughs> what heart could hold the weight of your love and know the heights of your great worth? What eyes could look on your glorious face shining light
Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to give a brief update that we are forming a search committee for our new lead pastor. And so you can join me in prayer for that. We have some requests out to various people. We've heard back from between 50 and 80% of the team, but so that I don't announce half of a team right now, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to wait. And uh, the meeting that we were planning to have this uh, upcoming week is not going to happen. It's going to be the week after sometime in late January, early February. So Please be praying for uh, the team as it forms and for all of the transition that is needed here as we search for a new lead pastor. Uh, before the children are dismissed and before we continue to sing, I'm going to pray for us all. Please join me in prayer. Great God in heaven, we thank you as we have sung that you are worthy of our praise. God, you are holy, holy, holy. And you are the Ancient of Days, the one who was and is and is to come. Jesus, thank you that you came the first time, that you were the promised Messiah who was born, lived a perfect life, and then died that death on the cross to save us, God, your people. Thank you that you've risen again, and we long, Christ, for the day that you will return in glory and establish a new heaven and a new earth, God, that is void and empty of any sin, sickness, and sadness. And yet, God, we live here and now, and we want to confess as your people that we need you. God, that we are sinful, and yet your mercy is more. Thank you for that grace and mercy that is poured out into our lives, not because of anything we have done, but according to great, your great mercy, God, you have saved us. And so, Lord, we confess our sin that is daily, hourly, God, kind of part of our sinful nature. And we thank you that your spirit indwells us and empowers us to live a godly life. God, so help us. We acknowledge this morning that we need you. And God, I pray that uh, as we even hear more today about what a church, a local expression of your global uh, body is supposed to be like, God, that we would be a church that also looks outward. God, thank you that we can look upward to you, that we can look inward to mature as believers, growing to be more like Christ. But you have given us a command to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. God, so I pray that as we live in this north end of Hamilton, as we live in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, God, that you would help us be your ambassadors. We cannot do it, God, on our own. We need your Spirit's help. And so, God, would we be people who are pointing others to the Savior, God, who has loved us and given himself for us. Continue to lead us, Lord, in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh... Kids can go down to Sunday school right now. If you have not yet registered your kids, oh, what? Oh, never mind. Old registration. I don't. I don't know what that means. But kids can go uh, down to Sunday school now. Um, while the kids are going down, I just want to encourage, uh, share an encouraging story. Some of you guys know. Um, I got to spend the last few weeks in Indonesia. And uh, part of that time was uh, in a, a tribal location where 20 years ago, these people had no access to God's word at all. Um, and there was one elder particularly that one of the missionaries was sharing about. And she was just saying how this man before had been very cold, very hard-hearted towards the gospel, did not want to speak, did not want to say anything, did not want to get involved at all. And he... Uh, um, one day ended up going to their like their Bible study sessions and uh, something like clicked uh, and he just kept eating. He just wanted so much more of it. And in one of the first uh, lessons, he they talk about how God breathed life into Adam. And he just goes, if it's God that's giving me breath right now, why would I use this breath to do anything other than to serve him and to worship him? And I was like, oh, we have to sing Great Are You, Lord, when I get back. Because um, for one, just this lyric, you, are, you give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, just stuck out so clearly to me when that happened. Because this was 
a people group that was in complete darkness that now had the light of Jesus Christ. And they were grabbing a hold of it. And it was beautiful. And it also reminded me that all the earth will shout your praise. Someday, people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation will give God the glory that he is worthy of. So let's stand together and let's sing this. Yeah.
everybody. You can grab your seats. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come together as a church family and, and worship you and praise you and, and study your word, God. And we just pray that you would lead us in this time together, that you would make your word clear to us, that you would just make your truth dwell in our hearts as we are in this place and as we move from this place today, God, and would you just give me strength as I seek to lead us through this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to be in Matthew 23 today. Um, we've been in a series over the last little, uh, last couple weeks just on our focus as a church. As we go through a time of transition and we're beginning to put together a team to search for our next pastor, we want to remind ourselves of of what we've been called here for. And so we've looked at us being a church that is focused upward towards God and a church that's focused inward as we encourage each other. And today we're going to be talking about how we are called to focus outward as well. And we're going to be looking at Matthew 23, which uh, is a little heavy. In fact, one, one uh, commentator referred to this as uh, the most unlikable passage in the Gospel of Matthew. It is a little intense as we get Jesus' warning to the Pharisees, the woes to the Pharisees, as he seeks to correct their uh, thoughts and their behaviors. I want to begin, though, with, with a story. There's a man named Jeffrey Sherman. Jeffrey Sherman is a, a television writer, but he's probably most famous for being the son of Robert Sherman, Robert Sherman of the Sherman Brothers. And if you don't know who the Sherman Brothers are, you should. The Sherman Brothers are the famous duo that wrote most of the best Disney songs. Jeffrey Sherman is the inspiration for the song, uh, Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down, as his dad wrote that about his polio vaccine that he had to take. And Jeffrey Sherman, when he was five years old, he went to visit his dad on the set of Mary Poppins. And he went to find his dad. His dad, Robert Sherman, was at a lunch table with a bunch of Disney executives, including Walt Disney himself. And Walt had this amazing ability to remember everybody's name who worked for him, but also the names of the children that they had. And so as Jeffrey came in, Walt said, hey, Jeffrey, can I show you around? And Walt took Jeffrey by the hand, and, and they walked around the different sets of, of Mary Poppins. And, and Walt was expecting Jeffrey to be in awe of everything they were doing. And he brings him to this room where they have the, rooftop, uh, the rooftops of London all built. And he says, so Jeffrey, what do you think? It's pretty incredible, eh? And this young child looks at Walt and he says, I don't know, it's all right, I guess. And Walt Disney goes, what? We've spent hours and hours working on this. What do you mean it's all right? And Jeffrey Sherman says, well, all the rooftops are right on the floor. People are going to notice that, aren't they? And Walt says, come here. And he gets down on his knees, and he holds his hands up like this. And he says, you see, when you look at it this way, it's going to look incredible. And then he says, that's the magic of a camera. And what he was teaching Jeffrey in that moment was, the way you view something changes your entire experience. And today, as we look at this passage in Matthew 23, what we're, going to say, what we're going to see is our view on life, our view on the gospel, our view on other people is going to shape how we experience life, and it's going to shape how we live out the love that God has for us. So it's important for us to understand that we need to have the right view, that we need to let God determine our view of the world of his love and his people that he's created. And as we go through this passage, we're going to see God crying out for the people who long to follow him that they need to have a focus that's outward, a focus on those who don't know Christ, a focus on those who don't know God that calls them in. And the first thing we see as we go through this passage is we must focus outward 
for the glory of God. The chapter begins like this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. You might wonder why we're looking at a passage that is Jesus rebuking Pharisees as we seek to follow God as the church. And I think the reason is, if we're honest, we have a lot more in common with Pharisees than we want to admit as the people who follow God. If you read through the Gospels and you don't see how you can relate to the Pharisees, I don't think you're reading the Gospels properly. Who were the Pharisees, the teachers of the law? They were people who longed for God's nation to become the light of the world again. And they believed that the only way God would bless Israel and bring them back to that prominent place was through obedience to the word. And so they called people to strict obedience to the law. They knew their Bibles better than anyone. They knew the law better than anyone. But their view, their focus was off. They created extra rules and extra barriers so that people wouldn't be able to accidentally break any of the laws. They were people who sought to follow the Lord but their understanding of how to do it was off. And so here's Jesus teaching. And he's teaching in the temple courtyards. And there's tons of people there, an enormous crowd. There are people there who don't really know who he is. His disciples are there. And in that crowd, there would be teachers of the law. There would be Pharisees. There would be Sadducees walking through the temple courtyards. And he's teaching this so that everybody can hear. And as much as he's giving a warning to the Pharisees to change the way that they view God and their relationship with him, he's giving a warning to everybody else saying, it's so easy to become like those Pharisees, so focused on rules that you miss the heart of God. Don't become like them. And he's teaching them. He says, these Pharisees, they sit on the seat of Moses. This is Language for the Pharisees have the authority of Moses. They've continued in the traditions of Moses. They are experts of, of the law. They're the ones who you go to to interpret the law. They're the ones that you go to when there's a, a legal matter going on. But the NASB translates this part, I think, the best when they say, the Pharisees have taken the seat of Moses. They don't deserve it, but they're acting in the role. In fact, the one who is rightfully to be sitting in the seat of Moses, to have the authority that Moses had, is Jesus. The first mistake that the Pharisees are making is they've placed themselves in the seat of authority. They've placed themselves as the ones who are able to interpret Scripture when really it's Christ who is the one in authority. It's Christ who they should be following. It is God who teaches us how to interpret his word. It's not up to us to decide what to do with God's word. But he says to them, be careful to do everything they tell you. Now, as you read through commentaries, what you'll see is there's two different ways that you can interpret this. One, it's sarcasm. Jesus is sarcastically mocking them, saying that, oh, make sure you do everything they tell you, but understand they don't actually know what they're talking about. Or two, and probably more terrifying, the Pharisees know how to read Scripture well. They know how to understand Scripture, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. These are people who know their Bibles. They know what the Bible is saying, but they're not living it out. So you can listen to them as they read a passage for you and tell you what it's talking about, but when you look at their lives, they have nothing to do with the actual words or message that's in the Bible. And Jesus is saying this in front of everybody to warn them, that's easy to do. It's easy to fall into a pattern where you know your Bible really well. 
but not live it out, not actually take it to heart, not let it put, not let God put his word in your heart so it changes your actions and the way you live. And as people here today, as we study the word, are we here just looking for information so that we can quote the Bible? Are we letting God change our lives through the work of the spirit as we seek to follow his word? We need to let Jesus be the authority in our life as he guides us into living a life that we can read through scripture and take into our everyday life. These are not just words. This is God's message to us on how to live. And he says they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads, put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. As we read through this, we're going to see this is a big problem that Jesus has with the way the Pharisees are living, the way the Pharisees are teaching. You see, he's saying they're putting a heavy burden onto people. They're bringing all of these rules that people need to follow, and they focus on all the ways that people disappoint God, and they never get to the ways that they can be forgiven. They never get to the love of God or the grace of God or the mercy of God. They just talk about the ways that people let God down, and it's crushing people as they start to realize they'll never live up to the expectations that God has for his people. They'll never live a life that can please a perfect God. The burden is just becoming more and more on people. And it's the exact opposite message that Jesus has. In Matthew 11, just several chapters earlier, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, Jesus says these words, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's not the message the Pharisees were picking up on. That's not the message they were delivering. They're making the burden incredibly difficult. And worst of all, they're not willing to even lift their little finger to help somebody. See, what this is saying is their focus is not outward at all. They demand obedience, and if you don't give obedience, they're not willing to help you. They're not willing to do anything to help somebody understand the love that God has for them. They're willing to teach you all the ways that you disappoint God, and they're not willing to do anything to help you figure out how to live a life that is godly, how to live a life where you can experience God's love. Jesus continues. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Jesus is starting to to hint here that not only is their outward focus misguided, but their outward focus is misguided because their upward focus is misguided. They, they're, they're acting as if they're holy. They're acting as if they have a right relationship with God, but really they're self-centered and self-indulgent. He even says that they make their phylacteries wide. Now, I don't know how many people here know what a phylactery is. Uh, probably not a lot of us, but this is what they are. If we go to the next slide, they're these little leather boxes, maybe a couple inches big, and people would wear them on their, their foreheads and, and wrap them on their arms And on these leather boxes, you can't really see it, but imprinted on them is the Hebrew letter shin. The Hebrew letter shin, which stands for Shaddai, as in El Shaddai, God Almighty. And and if we go to the next slide, you see how they're worn. The boxes would be sticking on people's foreheads, and and they'd be wrapped around the left arm, and wrapped so that there's seven... uh, coils that go around and then wrapped around your middle finger, which is supposed to, in their culture, connect to your heart. And they wear these passages, or sorry, they wear these phylacteries uh, to to live out Deuteronomy 11, 18. It's a symbol of this. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. So this was a practical way of living out that call in Deuteronomy that God has 
to focus on the words. And inside the phylacteries, on the one on your forehead, there's four scrolls. And on the one on your arm, there's one long scroll. And they each have four different passages on them that call the people to remember who God is um, and to remember the words that they are to dwell on. And so these phylacteries are to help you focus on God, to focus your life on his words, to remind you of the love that he has for you and your obedience as you follow him. And Jesus is saying, you've turned them into a thing of your own glory. You're making them bigger so that people will think you're holier than them. You're showing off And you're using God to do it. You're more concerned with what you look like and the perception that you have than God's actual call to you. And because of that, you're not living out the call that God has for you. And then Jesus says these words, But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher And you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth father because you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is saying to the crowd around them, you are to be focused outwardly to bring God's love to those who need to hear it. And you're to be focused on God and being obedient to him and following your father, your instructor. When you seek to follow out God's commands, when you seek to bring the gospel to people, it's not for your own glory. It's for God's. You are to humble yourself and serve him by sharing the love that you've experienced with those around you so that God's name would be glorified. And as a church, that is a great reminder for us that we are called to make an impact in this neighborhood and an impact in the communities that we live in and work in to share God's glory, not so that we would be known, but so that he would be known. Not so that we would be glorified, but so that he would be glorified. It's not about what we do here and how great we are. It's about pointing people to God and celebrating what he is doing in their lives. That is the warning that Jesus is giving to the people. Don't let this become a show about you and how great you are. But humbly serve God as you worship him as your savior and your teacher and your instructor and share God's glory so that people will be saved and know who God is. That is our role here as James North Baptist Church. And then Jesus goes on to make seven warnings to keep us focused on being outward. Seven warnings to the the Pharisees. He gives seven woes and a woe Typically, in Scripture, it means divine judgment. I'm going to read through all seven, and then we'll walk through them. But I want to read through it so that you could hear what Jesus said as he goes into this teaching. We don't, you don't need to follow along with me as you do this. I'm going to read it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift of the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it, by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Imagine being a Pharisee walking through the courtyard of the temple, probably on your way to to help someone understand the law or on your way to help somebody learn how to worship God and you hear Jesus saying that about you. It's intense. It's harsh. But Jesus is trying to get through to people here. The first warning we see, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Through the way that the Pharisees are living and the way that they teach, they're actually preventing people from experiencing true relationship with God. Heaven is not just a place where people go because they've been good enough. Heaven is not a place where people go to be rewarded for the life that they live. Heaven is the place where you get to spend eternity with the God who created you and the Lord who saved you. And they're not letting people experience true relationship with God because they don't know it themselves. When you think about Jesus' teaching in Luke 15... And you read through the story of the the two lost sons, as I like to call it, which might show my Timothy Keller bias. Um, But you look at the story of the two lost sons or the prodigal son, as as many of you probably know it. Um, That passage ends with a conversation between the older son and the younger son. It it ends with, sorry, with the older son and the father. And as the younger son has come home and there's a party, the older brother refuses to come inside. And the older brother says to his father, I've never disobeyed anything you've said. I've never left you. And you've never even given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. Do you see the heart that he has there? I've done everything I can to make you happy, father. I've never disobeyed a single word that you've said. I never left. I never went anywhere. But the father says to him, this sinner brother of yours has come home. He was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. You have been with me always and everything I have is yours. You see, what the older son didn't realize was it wasn't about what the the son could do with the father, but it was about knowing the father and being with the father. And he refused to go in to be a part of that family, a part of that celebration because he was so focused on all of the rules and things that he was following about himself and the status that he had. That he didn't go in and and rejoice with his father and, and his brother who came home. 
And the Pharisees have that same heart. They refuse to go and experience true relationship with God because they're so focused on trying to save themselves and earn their way into heaven that they've shut the door on themselves and anybody who follows them. We need to make sure that we don't do the same thing. And the warnings continue here. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. The question here is, what are you teaching? What do you believe about Jesus? Do you live the kind of life that other people can follow, and as they do, they'll experience more of God's love and grace as they seek to follow him obediently. What we teach people, they're going to learn and they're going to live out. So it's important that we make sure we're following God in our instruction and the way we live our life. Paul very clearly in his letters, multiple times, says, follow me as I follow God and you will experience him. Are we people who can say those same things? Or if we started to turn the Bible and use it for our own benefits, to validate our own thoughts and our own arguments? Are we seeking to make ourselves feel better by living out the way that we chose for ourselves and coding it in biblical language? As we seek to focus outward, we need to make sure that we're leading people to God so that they follow God, not so they follow us. That needs to be our focus so that we teach people to become Christ-like in their actions. Then he goes on, Woe to you blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gift of the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift of the altar that makes the gift sacred, uh, the gift, uh, sorry, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne, by the one who sits on it. There are two things that we need to see here in this warning that's given to the Pharisees. There are two important things. The first is we need to be people who we need to be people who are truthful. We follow the God of truth, and so we need to be truthful. At the time when Jesus was saying this, the Pharisees were teaching people that if you wanted someone to believe what you say, just swear by the angels, or swear by the stars, or swear by the gift on the altar. And it was a way of trying to force credibility into what you're saying. And what Jesus says here, and you can see it in Matthew 5 when he teaches them uh, a very similar thing. What Jesus is saying here is you should be people that are just trustworthy. You need to be people who others hear what you say and they believe it because you just always say the truth. If you want people to believe what you say about God to be true, then you better be people who tell the truth. What we say matters. Being people of the truth matters. All of the truth. We need to share all of it with people so that they can know God and trust our words because we seek to follow God and be trustworthy people. And the second part of this warning is very important. Jesus is telling us, asking us, what do you actually value? When people look at your lives, what do they see you valuing? Do you value the things that are God's or do you actually value God? And this is incredibly important. If we want people to see that we love God and that they should love God too, then they better be able to look at our lives and our schedules and say, wow, that person actually really cares about God. God must actually make a difference to their life because look how much devotion they have to him. And I think especially as people here who are parents of children, our children are watching us. And they are learning values from us. And if we don't live lives that value God and the gospel, how can we expect them to do the same thing? If people look at our lives and they see that we value work and we value education and we value sports and we value all these things, and then we fit God in when we can, what is the message that we're delivering to our children and the people around us? Do you value 
The gift on the altar, or do you value the being who dwells in the temple? Do you value the stars and the throne, or do you value the one who is on the throne? God needs to be the number one priority in our lives, and they should see that as people see our devotional life and how much we spend reading the word and, 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 and being in prayer and the priorities that we have in our lives. What do we value? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guide, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Here, again, we start to see what do you really care about? Do you focus on the rules that you can see in scripture, the checklist that you can do, or do you care about the heart that God has for his people? Jesus is saying about the Pharisees, they, they tithe perfectly. They tithe even to the point where they're giving a tenth of their herbs and spices, which not everybody did back then. But they've neglected justice and faithfulness. They've ne neglected caring for God's people. They've neglected actually living out the love that God has for people. And Jesus isn't saying the rules don't matter, but he's saying you can't live out all those rules and then live a life where people think you don't care about them. The rules matter because they help us understand who God is and the love that he has, and so that we can be led to care for God's people. I think one of the ways that we need to worry about this in the church is how comfortable would we be with a new Christian who's coming from a very tough background being here? I had a friend once who told me about a time when uh, somebody from the street started becoming interested in Jesus, and they had a drug addiction. And in the middle of a service, that person had to go outside um, because they were starting to drop too much in their, in their low. And, and they went outside, and they, they, they did some drugs, and they came back in to listen to the rest of the sermon. And you could see a lot of people in that congregation being like, what the heck? But isn't that the kind of person we want hearing the gospel? Isn't that the kind of person we want here? And that person's life changed from that point. They started off at a real rough place. But by the end of their life, they were following Jesus as closely as anybody else in the congregation. And I think we do this a lot as people. Is we want our kids to be in, in youth groups, and we want our church to be here with people, but we're very uncomfortable with those who we're not familiar with being in our presence sometimes. We're worried about the, the, the effect that they might have on us. And what we see here, one of the big differences between the way Jesus approached people and the way the Pharisees approached people is Jesus was willing to spend time with sinners. And the Pharisees shunned them. Are we so focused on looking right and following the rules that we're unwilling to reach out to people and bring them into our community, knowing that they're not perfect, knowing that the Spirit needs to do a lot of work in them, but saying, hey, you need to hear this message. You need to know God's love for you. And it might be uncomfortable for us, but we're going to walk with you through this because what matters to God is your hearts and justice and faithfulness. We're going to walk with you through this and lead you towards obedience with God, but we're okay that it's going to be rough to start off with. What kind of people are we going to be? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside uh, of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Our thoughts and our hearts are going to dictate our actions. And we need to make sure as we're memorizing scripture, as we're learning how to follow God, that we're making sure that we're allowing the spirit to move in our hearts, to change our hearts to that of Christ, so that we will follow him more closely in the way that he loves people and change the way that we view and love God. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. 
Whitewashed tombs is it's an interesting thing in the history of Israel. You see, in the month leading up to Passover, it would be the job for people to, to whitewash the tombs. And the idea that we get as we read here, we often think it's about making them beautiful so that people can see them and they're things that are, are nice. But the actual reason that tombs were whitewashed was so that they would stand out, so that you wouldn't touch them. Because if you were somebody who came into Jerusalem from outside in Israel, and you came all the way to be a part of Passover, and you touched a tomb that had a dead body in it, you would be unclean for seven days, and you would be unable to participate in the Passover celebration. And so these tombs were whitewashed so that people would notice them and stay away from them. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You're bright on the outside, but inside, you're full of death. You're, you're, you're completely unclean. You're something to be avoided at all costs. And then we get this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you're the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. Are you someone who acts like you're happy to be part of God's redemption plan? but really it makes no difference in your life. You see, what Jesus is saying here is, is that the Pharisees and, and some people would build up these tombs, uh, build these, these decorative things to rejoice in the, 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 the prophets that have been passed on, uh, the, the, the prophets that had existed in the past, and they would celebrate the things that God had done in the past. And Jesus is saying, don't you understand? You're part of the people who killed those people. Your heart is the same as those people who murdered those who brought God's word to them. And you're going to do it again. You act as if you're, you're happy to be a part of what God is doing. But really, internally, you want nothing to do with God's plan for people, with God's plan to call people to, to worship. You want to save yourself. You don't want anything to do with what God is doing. And then he ends, he concludes with this, these incredibly harsh words. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation." He says to the Pharisees, you want to believe that you are children of Abraham. But at the time when Jesus was teaching this, being the son of someone wasn't just biological. Being the son of someone meant you were like them. And Jesus is saying, you're not like Abraham. Abraham was called to be a blessing to all the nations so that they might know God and come to him. No, your father's not Abraham. Your father's the snake. The brood of vipers. That, that idea of a snake here, it's a deceitful animal, but all the Pharisees would have connected this very accusation with Genesis 3. Jesus is saying, you're someone who's pretending like you want to help people be like God, but you're leading them astray and destroying them. You think that you're clean and you're holy, but you are just as messed up and flawed as every other person. You are just as guilty of the bloodshed of those innocent people as everybody else. You need to be saved. You cannot save yourself. You are so focused on your own status that you seek to love those in your community well, you, you fail to love those in your community well, you fail to love God well, and you fail to love those outside this community well. Do you act like you're happy to be a part of God's redemption plan, but really it makes no difference in you? Do you act as if you're helping people, but really you're pulling them further away from God? And it's a really heavy chapter, but then we get these words as Jesus comes to a close. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, 
How often I have longed to gather your children together as hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I will tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, the last thing that we see here is that we are called to focus outward, to show the heart of God, to show the heart of Christ. Jesus gives all of these harsh woes to the Pharisees, all of these harsh warnings, but he says to them, don't you understand? I've longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I've longed to give you shelter, to give you love, to give you protection, to save you. That is what my heart is. I want you to turn to me, to follow me, and to help others come to me so that they can come under my wings as, as well. In Ezekiel, we have Ezekiel 33, verse 11. And God says this to the prophet. He says, Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? The heart of Christ, the heart of God, is for us to turn and follow him. To be obedient to him. And as we focus outward, we bring the love that God has for us to those outside so that they can know God too. If we go to the next slide, I think there is a picture. I just want to go through this very quickly. Many of us probably don't know who that man is. His name is Antoine Augustin Parmentier. He lived during the reign of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette in France. And this man is known as the father of potatoes. You see, at the time when he was alive, potatoes were the least popular food you could ever imagine, which is something I can relate to because they're disgusting. Um, potatoes were believed, I, don't, I said it, listen, you're going to understand. Listen, if you find out what this guy had to do to make you eat potatoes, you'd understand. They didn't eat potatoes. They thought potatoes could give you leprosy. In the world, they thought potatoes could mis make you uh, infertile. Uh, they were considered food for animals, maybe prisoners and slaves. And so people didn't eat potatoes in the world in the 1700s. Uh, it just wasn't popular. And this guy, he was actually arrested as part of the Revolutionary War by the Prussians. And in jail, he was fed potatoes. And he was like, this can change everything. See, potatoes are super easy to grow. They don't take a lot of resources. And you can grow tons of them. And he was like, if we can get people to like potatoes, we would save so much money. And so when he went back to France, he was like, it's my job to make people like potatoes. And he started doing publicity stunts for potatoes. Uh, it started off with him getting, uh, in the next slide, I think we see this. It started off with get, him getting celebrities to wear potato flowers in their like, clothes. So Marie Antoinette would wear them like, in her hair or in her shirt. King Louis would wear them in like, his buttonholes. And they started to make it like this beautiful thing that people would like. And then... King Louis gave him permission to do this. This is genius. He grew, he grew a field of potatoes, and, and they put royal guards all around the potatoes so that people would think they were worth stealing, like something the king wanted for himself. But they told the guards, listen, if anybody tries to steal them, let them. And he said, if anybody offers you a bribe, just take it. It doesn't matter what it is. And so people were tricked into thinking potatoes were good, and they started stealing them, and then they started eating them, and they became popular. That's why you suckers eat potatoes. <laughs> they tricked people into thinking potatoes were great, and it changed the world. If you go to the next slide, that's his grave. People put potatoes on his grave. <laughs> potatoes are now in the top five most popular crops that are grown the top five most valuable crops that are grown. And it started because somebody tricked people into thinking potatoes were good. And if Antoine Augustin Permentier, I don't speak French, if he can do that with something that's just completely gross and not valuable at all, how much more can we change the world with an actual message that is life-giving and changing? 
How much more should we be willing to bring the gospel to people because it's real and it's true and it's what people need to hear? We as the church need to focus outward because this message of the gospel changes everything for everyone. We don't need to try to scam people into it. We just need to tell people the gospel and God will grab a hold of their hearts and start to change lives. We focus upward as we worship God and we experience the love that he has for him so that we can encourage each other to do the same so that we can bring that gospel out to everybody who needs to hear it. It is a message that people are longing for in a dark world, in a lonely world. It's the truth and it's what we're called to do. And when we fail to live out our focus inwardly, upwardly, and outwardly, we're failing to live the life that God has called us to and our mission as a church. We have the message that can change lives. We cannot hold it to ourselves. And as we're doing that, the question we need to ask ourselves is what does our life say about the God that we love and worship, our priorities, our words, our relationships, the way we treat people? Are we bringing them the gospel and showing them God's love like they need to hear? That is our duty, that is our role, to bring the life-giving change that Jesus brought to us and bring it to those around us. Uh, Band, you guys can come up and I'm going to close in prayer here. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. We thank you that you found rebels like us and brought us into your love and grace and mercy and called us into your life, the life that you've planned for us for, for all of eternity. We thank you for your love and we pray that you would strengthen us as people to share that love with those around us so that they could see you and the love that you have for them and they would follow you in worship and obedience and the life that you have for them as well. Would you give us opportunities to glorify your name in our neighborhood? To celebrate with what you are doing as you save people in Hamilton and all throughout the earth. And would you cause us to worship you and love you and live lives that reflect your glory so that other people will see you as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. Would this be our prayer?
As we prepare to head out, I'll just remind you about the Karen service this afternoon. They're having those baptisms. If you know those guys are going to baptize, great time to come and encourage them. Listen to God's word as we leave. These words from Peter, reminding us who we are and this message that we have to share. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is what we proclaim. This is who we are as the church. Let's go into this world in grace and peace with the Spirit guiding us and with the message of Jesus Christ on our lips.